Welcome back to the studio and welcome to another painting project. Here I'm going to be working on an 11 by 14 inch homemade linen panel and I'm using some pretty average reference material. Now, don't get me wrong, South Island of New Zealand is absolutely stunning and I'm blessed to be able to paint some of these subjects which are really just down the road from me. But sometimes it doesn't quite go according to plan. Now, take a quick pause. Take note of all the colors that I'm going to be using here. We'll talk about some of the mixes throughout this demonstration. But I really want to talk to you about how I've used the reference material to go above and beyond what I'm seeing there in front of me to create something a bit more interesting, a bit more special. Now we might be similar in that we're not painting from perfect photographs. In fact, I hardly ever find a photograph that I want to copy verbatim. And so I'm really using my photographs to tease out bits of information about the landscape, but I'm trying my darndest in the studio to create something that goes above and beyond. To capture a moment, a feeling, a mood, something about the way the landscape feels when I'm standing there looking at it and not so much at what the camera captures. So it's all about knowing what to leave out and what to put in. And if I'm going to exaggerate something, what are some of those points that I'm going to amplify? And if I'm going to hold back in a certain area or diminish something else, what do those look like too? How does it go to serve the greater purpose of creating a moment in time and hopefully conveying a feeling to the viewer? Now, I don't hit it out of the park on every painting, far from it. But that's the intent that I have for each and every project that I'm engaged in. I want to create something unique, something special, it just goes above and beyond what I'm seeing in those references. Now, if you're working from photographs and copying photographs, this is not to put you down at all, far from it. But one thing I try to do is just so I can keep my interest high during a project so I don't get bored with it. I like adding a bit of that imagination to the scene and pushing things a bit further than what I'm seeing. The other thing I really enjoy is incorporating elements that I've seen in other locations, like this willow tree, for instance. It wasn't growing here along the banks of this little stream just outside of Glen Orkey in the South Island of New Zealand, but I thought it could add a really nice dimension to the painting if I had a couple of poplars and this nice willow. I've often heard people say, well, with this style of painting, why don't you just take a photograph and I think this comment is made by people who clearly don't paint. But maybe they haven't seen this process of where so many different elements go into making the scene. It's not just one photograph. There's an accumulation of plein air studies, pencil sketches, and a multitude of photographic images that go to make up the scene. Now, one thing those photographs are absolutely essential in showing me is the visual language, how the landscape's put together. Now, sometimes a photograph can be limited in its range of color or in the values or tones that it's showing. You know, sometimes a photograph can be perfectly exposed for those highlights, leaving the shadows completely black or the opposite. The shadows might be perfectly exposed or those highlights could be totally burned out. But it's taking a whole multitude of images of different times of day, different angles of different subjects, and then throwing it all together on the panel that's what I find most enjoyable about this process. In any given reference file for any painting project that I'm working on, it's normally around 150 to 300 images. Now that's a lot of photographs, but I'm looking at the way light falls across mountain peaks, the way clouds break apart as they're swirling around, and how green diminishes in space. But I also enjoy looking at the visual language of things like rock, how does the rock's edge look when it's caught in the sunlight? How does the three-dimensional form get communicated as the value gradually shifts downwards into a deep shadow? Having a ton of reference materials really does help me in adding these little details that can make a more interesting painting. Now, of course, you can overdo it and try and throw too much into your scene. And that's when knowing what to leave out can really help. Now, I might have a little bit of experience here, but it's still my tendency to try and put too much into a painting. And there's gonna be a lot of detail packed into this little 11 by 14.
And recently I've been playing with a new approach, going slightly more detailed with my block in, leaving fewer strokes of detail to go over the top. The result is a bit thinner, with more of that imprimatura or ground color showing through some of the gaps in the brush marks. Now I always start off with either a burnt sienna or a burnt umber underpainting or an initial tone. This is rubbed back thoroughly and I'm painting over a dried color layer rather than working over the stark white primed linen. There's always little gaps between the brush marks where a little brush of warmth comes through, adding to the richness of the colors. I'm quite strategic and methodical while I'm working, and I hold to that pattern in the studio working with whatever's furthest away first and bringing the scene forward. And as I bring that scene forward, I pay attention to what my reference is telling me. Not necessarily exactly the order of the trees, but something here about these trees getting darker as they come forward, I figure will help me communicate more depth. Notice the difference between some of these trees in the midground and some of those pine trees in the distance. I'm absolutely obsessed with creating that illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. That's one of the coolest things I find about realist painting, that you can create a little world that your viewer could almost step into. Now, in a recent video, I talked about some do's and don'ts for creating depth in your scene. Not only did we talk about the tonal values and your arrangement of values, keeping those darkest darks for the immediate foreground, but we also talked about color. And here, some of these trees on the banks of our little river are gonna be a bit more of an intense green the further forward that they come. And when this is contrasted with some washed out hazy greens in the background, then that too can create that much needed depth. I only had a hint of a tree on the bank on the left-hand side in my photographic reference. And I'm really glad I added some of these bigger trees in here because the intensity of the yellowish green on the sunlit side of these poplars, I was really looking forward to contrasting with that deeper violet of the mountains beyond. Again, hopefully adding to that three dimensionality. And in addition to playing with the color, I'm also playing with the texture of the paint. Here I'm using Liquin Original for those initial block ends, but also I'm using Liquin Impasto for the subsequent layers of textured brushwork. This is applied here with a old worn out bristle dagger brush. I've heavily loaded just the ends of those bristles to create some nice little pinpoints of light green, reminiscent of these willow leaves catching that mid-morning sunlight. I load an ivory rigger with just a fine amount of some light gray and another one with some darker near black, which is a combination of burnt umber and ultramarine blue to create some of the branches of the willow tree. Now these bristles are fantastic for creating texture in the foreground, reminiscent of some grasses and weeds growing along these rocky banks. I'll then come back with an ivory rigger again and bring out some individual shadows of rocks as well as grass stalks and any foliage that might be caught in the sunlight. It was a bit of a trick painting all of these rocks and trying to keep the sizes and shapes interesting. Now, of course, they get smaller and smaller as they go back into space. But as I bring them forward, I try to pick out individual rocks with a bit of character, with some cracks and divots in the surface that might catch the light in an interesting way. I'm also thinking about the shape of this stream as it comes forward. There's a few cool references that I have of this cascade. And of course, it's seen from different angles and different photographs that I have. So I had to find something that would fit whilst providing a situation where I could have some nice reflections too. Now with water, normally I like to paint whatever's lying under the surface of the water first. I refer to that as the topography. So if we were to drain the body of water away, what are we looking at? 
what's that underlying surface look like? Here, obviously, it'd be slightly silty, sandy, and a few rocks would be around the place, especially at the base of this cascade. But in the area over on the left, I started painting it a different way, starting with the reflection first. I thought I'd come back later and add some of those details underneath after I'd already painted that reflection. It turned out that this approach did work, although it was the opposite of what I'd normally do. But over on the right-hand side, below that cascade, I went ahead with my normal method of painting whatever was underneath first and then coming back over the top and adding these reflections, like applied here with a synthetic filbert brush and a very translucent mix of ultramarine blue, quinacridone magenta, and crumnitz white. With a synthetic ivory rigger, I apply some lighter blue streaks, indicating their reflection just as the water pours over a cascade, and then apply some bright little pinpoints of light, again with an ivory rigger at the base of the cascade. I'm using this in conjunction with some other transparent colors, like transparent yellow oxide, ultramarine blue, and quinacridone magenta, to provide some depth with some darker tone applying this as a glaze. Now a glaze is just a tiny amount of paint suspended in a medium. However, don't get it twisted. We're not using copious amounts of medium here. I still stick to that ratio that I normally use of one part medium to three parts paint. The trick is in the opacity of the paint that we're using. I use colors that are transparent in nature anytime I'm applying a glaze. Now, glazes can also be light in nature, and sometimes you can apply these slightly more opaque, but with a dry brush technique. We'll talk about glazing pretty soon in another video. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching this little project come together. But if you want to take your painting techniques even further, then why not check out the full version? It clocks in at well over an hour long, and it's loaded with technical information, like the colors that I'm mixing, the brushes that I'm using, and how I apply things like glazes and layer my brushwork to create this intricate detail. This certainly will supercharge your art practice and give you a load of techniques to get on with in the studio. You can find it all on Tish Academy by clicking that link in the description down below. But when you click that link, you'll get yourself a free seven day trial. So check it out now. There's tons of painting content there. Hundreds of hours worth, in fact. So check it out. It's all part of Tish Academy, my online art school. I look forward to seeing you there. Well, thank you so much for stopping by the studio and spending this time with me here today. I've really enjoyed your company and I'll see you again in another video. Here's the painting. Let me know what you think by leaving me a comment down below.